Imagine the world in the year 2040. Thousands of square kilometers of the Sahara Desert are covered by solar panels. The electricity is then carried by superconducting wires all over the globe, where it simply circulates until needed. This was made possible by a wondrous new material. It's a room temperature superconductor, discovered using quantum computers. You see, before we had quantum computers, when we wanted to find new materials, we just had to synthesize them in the lab, one after another, and test their properties. This was a very long and arduous process. But with quantum computers, everything accelerated a thousand times. Because instead of synthesizing the materials, we can simply simulate them. We can test their properties in simulation. And work that used to take a year, we can now do in a single afternoon. So quantum computers may help us solve the climate, the climate crisis and the energy crisis. The scenario I just described is just one of many things we are likely to see from quantum computers and quantum technology. In fact, in the next 30 years, many aspects of our lives will be affected by this new technology, as much as it has been affected by regular computers to date. Medicine, chemistry, physics, artificial intelligence, finance, you name it. And today, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about quantum computers and this revolution in the making. But first, some introductions. Hi, I'm Shai Machnes. I'm a physicist, and I build quantum computers. Of course, I don't do this alone. I do this with my colleagues here. This is the Open SuperQ EU research project. And we are part of a larger community of about 5,000 scientists and engineers trying to tackle this problem. Now, before I can tell you about quantum computers, I need to tell you something about quantum physics. So, what is quantum physics? Quantum physics deals with the smallest elements of nature. Electrons, protons, atoms, molecules, stuff like that. And it turns out that the rules down there of the very small are very, very different than what we're used to up here in the macroscopic world. Specifically, very small particles can be in more than one place at the same time. And I mean really be in more than one place at the same time. This is not a euphemism. This is not a statement about ignorance or something in statistics. Really, actually, an electron can be in multiple places at the same time. Now, what does this have to do with quantum computers? Well, with regular computers, we have a bit. It's either zero or one. The electron is either here or there. But with quantum computers, we make extensive use of this property to be in multiple positions, which we call superposition. We utilize this superposition to make something we call qubits, quantum bits, that can be both zero and one at the same time. Now, what happens if you insist and you want to measure whether the electron is here or there? Well, then something strange happens. The electron stops being in a superposition. The superposition collapses, and it becomes a regular boring bit. It's either zero or one now. OK, but which one? Because it was both before. Well, now it gets even weirder because the process appears to be random. And this is what Einstein famously objected to when he said that God doesn't play dice with the universe. But as Niels Bohr reminded him, even Einstein doesn't tell God what to do, and the process is indeed apparently random. Now, to be quite honest, we physicists don't quite understand what happens when a superposition collapses. This has something to do with how the quantum particle interacts with the measurement device. And there are lots of ideas what could happen there. Personally, I subscribe to the Everett Many World interpretation, which says that for all practical purposes, every time you have this collapse, the universe splits into two parallel universes. One in which the 
bit is zero and one in which the bit is one. Now, regardless of how this mystery of the collapse will get solved eventually, for us, the people that build quantum computers, this is the stuff of nightmares. Because midway through our quantum computation, our quantum bit, which was both zero and one, suddenly becomes a regular boring bit, zero or one. So we have to put in a lot of effort to prevent this from happening. And the number one thing we can do is cool down our computer. Now, if outer space is about three or four degrees above absolute zero, we cool our quantum computers a hundred times more to a few hundreds of a degrees above absolute zero. And I'll tell you in a bit how we actually get that done. Okay, so let's say we manage to beat collapse or at least suppress it. What can we do? Well, we can start having fun. We can have more than one qubit. So let's say we have two, and we set them up in this superposition. Either they're both zero or they're both one, okay? So we have superposition, but we also have correlation, because if you know what one qubit is, then you know what the other is. And then we'll do the following really strange thing. We'll take one of these qubits and leave it here on Earth and send the other electron to the Andromeda galaxy, millions of light years away. Now, we know previously that if we measure either of the qubits, we will get either zero or one. Now, the truly amazing thing is that quantum physics guarantees that the other qubit will give us exactly the same measurement result. So we have a process that's both random and correlated, and it can be correlated from two edges of the universe. This is what Einstein referred to as spooky action at a distance. This is the basis for stuff like quantum teleportation and quantum cryptography. Now, you can ask me, like, Shai, how does any of this make sense? This sounds complete nonsense. And I'll say, well, sorry, but that's just the way the universe works. I mean, nature doesn't owe us to make sense, certainly not to our big monkey brains. Right? Nature is the way she is. It's our job to learn how nature works and just deal with it. Okay? Now, let's recap. We have superposition. Superposition is the ability for a quantum particle to be in more than one place at the same time. It can be both zero and one. We have the thing that keeps me worried at night, which is the collapse of the superposition. And we have entanglement. Entanglement is the combination of superposition and correlation. And I think now you can start understanding why quantum computers are so different than regular computers. Quantum computers are actually machines to generate entanglement, to suppress collapse, and to manipulate these things very, very precisely. And regular computers just shuffle zeros and ones around. Uh, by, by way of analogy, if a regular computer is a car, a quantum computer is a rocket. You want to go to the supermarket to get some milk, you take a car. You want to settle Mars, you take a rocket. And no matter how fast your car is, it'll never get you to Mars, right? So similarly, if you want your Excel spreadsheet to run faster, then you get the new chip from AMD. But if you want to design a material that's as clear as glass, but as strong as steel, you use a quantum computer. Okay, now I'll tell you something that's even more amazing. If we have, if we have a quantum computer that has 300 quantum bits, 300 qubits, it'll have more memory capacity than the number of atoms in the entire universe. Now, I'll make this a bit clearer. Let's say you are capable of building a regular computer where every atom is one bit, okay? And you took every atom in the universe, every planet, every star, every galaxy, and you took all the universe to build this regular computer. It will still not be able to simulate what a quantum computer with 300 qubits will be able to do. And we are very likely to have this within 10 years. And how do I know? 
because just two months ago, right, in October 19, Google achieved what is known as quantum supremacy. They built a quantum computer with 54 qubits. One of the qubits didn't work, so they were left with 53. And the calculation they performed using this quantum computer is something that is more than the largest supercomputer in the world can replicate. Again, a quantum computer has, past tense, outstripped the capability of the world's largest supercomputer. This is science fact, not science fiction. And this is the new world in which we're going to live. Okay. Now, how does a quantum computer actually look? Well, this is a small QPU, quantum CPU, okay? It has only two qubits. It's part of the Open SuperQ project. The little square in the middle is the quantum part when it's cold enough, and the circular things around the edges is where we connect the wires. Now, as I mentioned previously, we have to cool this down. To do that, we connect it to this very weird chandelier you see behind me. The chip goes at the cylinder at the bottom, and all the weird wires are coming from the warm outside all the way down to the very, very cold chip at the bottom. Now, how do we cool this? Well, that's actually very simple. We just buy a fridge. Yeah, it's an expensive fridge. It costs a million dollars or something, but you can actually go to a company and buy a fridge like this, and this is what it looks like, okay? This is from IBM Labs. It, it's essentially a series of thermos flasks, one inside the other with some liquid helium, and it just works, okay? So this is what a quantum computer looks like. Now, if you look at this picture, it may look a little bit clunky, right? There are pipes and wires running and all sort of stuff like that. And you'd be right, because in many respects, we are in the 1950s of quantum computation. Okay? Our quantum computers are cumbersome, and they're error-prone, and they're slow, right? We're just getting started. Now, in the 1950s, engineers used them to do some kind of scientific-type calculations, but it was 25 years before computers became ubiquitous, and it was another 50 years before it, they revolutionized society. Similarly, quantum computers will take time. But because this is the 21st century, everything works a little bit faster. Another point to remember is that in the 1950s, they couldn't imagine Facebook, and they couldn't imagine Fortnite, and they couldn't imagine Wikipedia. So our ideas of what we could do with quantum computers today are probably kind of a little bit off. But there are a few things we know. Okay. The first thing we can do is we can understand very complex molecules, such as proteins and how they fold. If we can do that, we can design better medication, better drugs, that will help us live better and longer. Another thing we can do is understand chemical processes in a very detailed manner. This will help us improve a lot of the chemical industry. For example, there is a chemical process called the Haber-Bosch process which is responsible for most of the fertilizer in the world. But it's very expensive energetically. With quantum computers, we are likely to find a way of doing it cheaper. And that'll help poor countries feed themselves. Quantum computers will completely revolutionize material science. We'll be able to find new materials with exciting properties, like the superconducting, the room temperature superconducting material I talked about in the beginning. And quantum computers will help us train the next, next generation artificial intelligence systems. Whether that is a good or bad thing, I leave to you. Now, because of the huge potential of quantum computers, this has begun something of an international race. So every large tech company, Google, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, uh, Ali, uh, Alibaba, etc., etc., they all have large groups working on this. Similarly, research projects, uh, research budgets in the EU, in China, in the US, they're all in the billions and growing. Even companies like Daimler are using the small quantum computers we have today 
to research chemistry for uh, batteries for electric vehicles. And Goldman Sachs is already using quantum computers to try and research how to optimize option portfolios. And there are tons and tons of startups, like Mushroom After the Rain. Okay? The, the environment right now is sort of a mix between a 1950s arms race, a 1960s moon race, and a 1990s internet gold rush. Okay. So what can you do about it? How does it relate to you? Well, if you know a little bit of programming, you can probably program a quantum computer today. IBM has made a five qubit quantum computer available for free online. Just Google IBM Quantum Experience. There's a web interface, tutorials, videos, everything you need, it's a lot of fun. If you want to program quantum computers more seriously, then you'll need to do about a couple of university level courses, one about math and one about quantum programming. And again, everything is available free online. If you actually want to help design the next generation quantum computer, then you really need to know the physics, and that means a PhD. <laughs> now, if you're running a big company or looking for investment opportunities, keep your eyes open for quantum technology, specifically quantum sensing and quantum communication. These will be coming online within three to five years. And then looking a bit further, five to 10 years, you'll see quantum computers starting to be used in chemistry and material science. And finally, if you're in charge of encryption and communication security, I'll start looking into switching out the regular RSA cipher with something that is quantum proof. Okay, this is the practical stuff. But beyond that, quantum physics and quantum computers are weird and they're great. And they're great because they're weird. And there's a lot of material online from videos in YouTube and books and websites and whatever you want. You can learn a lot more about it. So just be curious and be prepared for a future that's a lot more interesting and a lot more quantum than you previously expected. Thank you.